Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Zerbukin uh, for your five minutes. Doctor, I recognize you, sir. Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Thomas Zerbuk, in a Swiss name uh, from the mountains in Switzerland, and uh, I'm a professor of space science and aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. I run a research group with uh, six space instruments in space right now, and uh, we're operating those and developing a breakthrough science uh, and, uh, that is published in uh, premier journals around the world. I'm also the Associate Dean for Entrepreneurial Programs and concerned about spreading of innovation and entrepreneurship in our educational mission at this university and uh, universities around the country. This is a period of limited resources and we need to focus to position ourselves for better times. The way to do this is to ensure that a talented workforce will be available and disruptive innovations and technology break breakthroughs are pursued. We need to do this through low-cost and modest-sized missions. The talented workforce and the innovations will be developed primarily by universities and industry, particularly small businesses, and not primarily NASA centers. Hence, we need to pursue a strategy in which universities and industry, as well as NASA centers, are fully engaged. Today, I want to focus on two key aspects of this strategy, the focus on people, and the focus on disruption, innovative disruption. And I want to briefly uh, talk about the balance, the program balance that is responsive to both of them. The number one priority of the space program, and especially its science program, should be talented people. Every mission in space, great or small, is carried out by people, not paperwork. We need people and their know-how. We have to ensure that NASA's space missions have access to the very best talent. How do we do that? First, we must recognize that top talent does not just hang around and wait for better times. Builders want to build. Innovators will innovate. And NASA leadership must be focused not just on the glory of days past, but the aspirations and dreams of the innovators of the future. Second, some of this talent will be at NASA centers, but most of the talent will be in academia and industry, particularly in small companies. Therefore, encouraging competition in emergent space industries will keep top talent focused and uh, on efforts that ultimately will aid this nation in achieving its most ambitious goals through both technical innovation and reduced cost. The next priority in addition to people is innovative disruption. Disruption is good. Disruptive programs overturn old paradigms create new markets and engender new value systems. These programs focus on smaller spacecraft, rapid turnaround missions, and I'm convinced that uh, science programs with these kinds of priorities will look different than the ones that we're building today. Consider, for example, the RACS program at the University of Michigan, which built and launched two CubeSats within two years uh, for less than a million dollars. These NSF-funded tiny satellites make new measurements probing the origins of space weather, especially in high latitudes, the auroral regions. And the first one failed a few uh, weeks into orbit. It's tough to do this. And the second one has now made measurements for over a year, research that is published in our premier journals. Also, this mission has provided hands-on experience for 50 of our best students. Many of these leaders work at SpaceX and some of the new space companies, in fact, being leaders of uh, certain uh, domain expertise, they're already really shortly after graduating, and some of them work at NASA, JPL, and other NASA centers. They got experiences most students in the U.S. did not. RAX is all about innovative disruption, training of the world's best talent and for our space program. So how do we build a program that's responsive to these kind of constraints? And uh, I do believe that a program like this re requires small and responsive missions and projects from suborbital to large strategic missions. It's a big priority particularly to invest in modest size and principal investigator led uh, missions such as discovery or new, front or new frontiers or venture class missions depending on the uh, respective community. These missions have provided the best value for the money invested. That's the type of program where the research resulting in NASA's first Nobel Prize was conducted, and it's the type of program that built the spacecraft currently orbiting planet Mercury, and one of my sensors is on there. Consider, for example, 
the University of Michigan Cygnus mission that was recently uh, selected that's focused to eliminate one of the biggest uncertainties and predictions of big storms, such as hurricanes and some of the storms that bring tremendous amounts of rain here uh, sometimes. The uncertainty that relates to the strength of these storms. The science payload is approximately 100 times smaller uh, in, in mass, in price, and in power than con conventional satellite wind measuring instruments, which enables an entire constellation of these sensors to be flown at lower cost. So the use of this constellation uh, reduces the revisit time and therefore the time resolution of the most pivotal measurements of these winds from days to hours, which is needed to uh, observe the inner core processes of these storms. So these short-term priorities, however, must be balanced and aligned with big bets and big thinking worthy of NASA. NASA science should stretch our imagination, stimulate our thinking, and demonstrate leadership worldwide. We must remember that the work that we do is not purely scientific, technological or economic or military-based. The prime discoveries that further our understanding of the cosmos have fueled and inspired the human imagination across all cultures and all times, and I believe we'll do so in the future. Thank you so much.